energy drink for your mind. Three hosts, three actors, three friends with three really different perspectives. I'm Rico E. Anderson. I am Sasha Kerbo. And I'm Rochelle Henry. Prepare yourselves for 60 minutes of high voltage conversation. And get ready to supercharge your brain. Because it's time for... The Lightning Hour, Nerdy Edition! Yes! This week's guest on The Lightning Hour, ladies and gentlemen, is TJ Storm. TJ Storm is an American action actor and seven-time martial arts master's Hall of Fame inductee. Storm is best known for his acting role in Marvel's Punisher Warzone and his performance caption work as Godzilla in Godzilla and Godzilla King of the Monsters. He's Colossus in Deadpool, the Apex Predator in The Predator, and Darth Vader in Vader Immortal and in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. He's also played Iron Man in Captain America Civil War, Ant-Man in Ant-Man, as well as Baby Groot, Teenage Groot, Rocket Raccoon, and so many more. TJ has played a countless variety of other characters, such as characters in The Green Lantern, Avatar, and so many video games. TJ has also appeared in the reboot of Kickboxer, starring Dave Bautista and Jean-Claude Van Damme, as well as the soon-to-be-released supernatural thriller Revenger on Netflix and Betrayed. He has voiced several characters in video games and animes, including Lucian in League of the Legends, uh, Marduk Tacking, Birdie in Street Fighter V. He also performed in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, um, Edge Master in Soul Calibur, Josh Stone in Resident Evil, um, Agnes in Devil May Cry 4, and others. TJ Storm was born in Indiana and raised in Hawaii. His TV show credits include Conan the Adventurer, Bold and the Beautiful, and Falling Skies. Other video games include X-Men, Spider-Man, Thor, Call of Duty, Prototype, and Knack, to name a few. TJ is an avid gamer of both video games and Dungeons and Dragons for over 30 years. He's also an eighth degree black belt and supports charities that work with racial equality, animals, children, and education. He also teaches motion capture at his studio, the Mind's Eye Action Actors Academy in LA. You can look them up at mindseyetribe.com. And something cool is I can attest to how great of a school they are because I'm one of his students. He is not only an amazing teacher, but he's an amazing friend and he's incredibly talented. So I'm so happy he's gonna be here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, TJ Storm! Wait! Four or five moments. I'm sorry? Four or five moments, that's all it takes. To... Be a hero. Uh -huh. Godzilla is with us today. Let the nerding out to begin. TJ, it's great to see you today, man. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to be here. This is awesome. I'm so happy you're here with us. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. This is really, really cool. 
Hi, TJ. Thank you for joining us today. So you've played a huge variety of characters in the voiceover world. Are there any that stand out to you as personal favorites? Um, you know what? I've grown up playing video games. I absolutely love playing video games. And so to be in the video games that I grew up playing is, is especially rewarding. It's awesome. There's a, a fighting game called Soul Calibur. I am the edge master in Soul Calibur. I'm, I'm like the master that introduces you to the game. And, and he's the one who holds uh, the Soul Calibur, the sword itself. Uh, so that was awesome. But I'm very proud. And I have Birdie in Street Fighter. He's a big uh, cockney uh, dude with a mohawk. And he talks like this. He's, he's obnoxious, isn't he? And they, it's just really fun to be a part of these, these things that you grow up playing. But one of the things that I'm really, really, really proud of there is a absolutely huge game, uh, and only for the most part, only hardcore gamers know of this game. But it is probably one of the top three games played in the entire world. It's uh, a, a free-to-play game called League of Legends. It is a, a really, really big game. Um, but I get to play. I'm fortunate enough to play the first uh, black character ever in the game, and his name is Lucian, oh. uh, the Purifier. So I am really, really so proud to be able to be a part of a universe and, and bring that diversity to it. That's cool. Now, now with this particular profession, you work a lot behind the scenes as well um, with uh, motion capture and performance capture. Can you explain to our audience be the difference between the two? First, uh, it's based on a technology called motion capture. Motion capture is when you put on a very tight suit with these little white reflective markers at almost every joint. You've probably seen them in, uh, either comedy sketches or behind the scenes sketches, or when you're watching uh, Avengers, you see Spider-Man wearing that gray suit with all the little markers on it. That's a motion capture suit. We wear that suit, we walk into a special room that is surrounded by at least a hundred cameras in many cases. And each of those cameras is shooting out infrared light. So you're, walk you're walking out into an ocean of infrared light, which you can't see. Then the infrared light bounces off of all of those little markers and goes back to the cameras. And, that, and the camera can't see you, it can only see white light. And that is, the white, that, that is the light that is reflected back to the cameras. Those cameras send that information to a computer and that computer reconfigures all of those points of light into a living constellation. Uh, it looks like my form. It, has no, it doesn't have my face, it can have any face, it doesn't have my skin, it can have any skin. Uh, so, I look like the Predator. I have been Darth Vader, Godzilla. It can be any skin they want to drop on me. They, they make me look like what they need for that project. And uh, that is motion capture. And motion capture is the technology. Performance capture is what uh, people like me and Rochelle do when we're in the volume. When we put on that suit, it is the art of acting with the motion capture technology on you especially when they're in your face. Sometimes you put on a helmet with this little mandible and has cameras pointed back at her face and lights that shine into your face. And it can pick up all of the muscles moving in your face, especially when they put dots all over your face. All of that together, the art of acting in motion capture is called performance capture. And that's the difference between performance capture and motion capture. Motion capture is the technology. Performance capture is what artists like me and stunt people and gymnasts and sword masters and actors do in the motion capture volume. Is there any difference with regular acting? Uh, do you have to like exaggerate a little bit so the camera would, I don't know, catch something spe specific or not? Is there a difference between regular acting and... Acting? That's a really, really good question. Um, I have a school called the Mind's Eye Tribe Action Actors Academy. That is exactly what we teach. There are differences in certain cases. Now, a lot of people say, it's just acting. That is kind of true, uh, but it's kind of like painting. Painting requires several different brushes and there's several different techniques. Even in acting itself, there are several different ways to act, to get to a certain point. In certain games, uh, fighting games, for instance, you mind if I stand up a little bit? No, yeah. go for it. Oh, fighting games, everything's a little bit bigger, so you'll, you'll have this bigger than life action thing. Whereas in movies or in triple-A games that are all about the drama, kind of like The Last of Us, for instance. Uh, they really want to get into here. They want to know what's happening here, which is very cinematic. It's very much like a film. And 
in those cases, you had better be a really good actor because all that's happening is right here. You're not seeing all the breath. You're not, you're not doing the oversized reactions. You're just living each second with emotional truth. And that's acting at its core. Whereas some things require very particular movements. So if I'm portraying something that hasn't existed before and I have to move in a particular way when I'm telling you something, then you have to train for that because that's kind of weird. Uh, we have an entire class that teaches you creature movement and there's a particular art to it. We have another class that teaches how to use swords and lightsabers and stuff like that. And that's a whole course that you take. We have another class that teaches you tactical movement with uh, firearms and teaches you how the right way to move. Because if you have to portray a special forces person or a Marine, there's a very particular way to do it. And there's a lot of people in the military. So when they watch you walk around and you're like, hey, I'm good with a gun. And you're like, this guy's never held a gun before. Come on. So it, we make sure that you don't make that mistake. We teach you how to move tactically and properly with the right safety measures in place. And when you look at John Wick, he trained really, really hard. Keanu Reeves trained really, really hard. And so do stunt people. They have to train all the time. So we help actors and stunt people get to that level. Uh, we do it with swords, guns, creature movement, athletics, uh, and we have a class called The Hero's Journey. We teach you how to move like a hero and or a superhero and how to understand all of those uh, uh, nuances. We also have a class called Magic, Sorcery, and the Force because oh, we God. work... Michelle's done it. She's awesome at this. I'm going to say, something tells me you've taken that class. Yes. Who would not? Who would not? It is really, really fun. But it, it, I've worked on a lot of games where people, they don't, they're not fans. First off, they're not fans of the genre. I, I feel like some of you guys are fans and, and you get it internally. So it's easy for you to translate what the force should look like when you're using it or what magic should look like when you're using it but if you've never done it before you're not a fan you don't know how to do it you're like yeah and that's not quite right and they need to get to the level of we believe that you're a jedi we believe that you're a sorcerer supreme so whatever that is we can help you with that fans know and fans will call you out on it fans know if you do this for the most part, everybody should know that this is the Vulcan salute. But if you're doing the Vulcan salute and you're doing it like this, you <laughs> just don't even know how many people would be like, yo, you gotta <laughs> bring that come out. <laughs> because I've been on threads where people are like, oh, down. you are insulting a whole entire franchise. Or if you do like this. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah. So the fandom, fandom, you know, DJ Phantom, the Phantom ain't no joke. Relationships have been lost because of it. Yes. That. <laughs> that is not in Lost in Space. Exact. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You know what, TJ? It was really cool. Uh, just real quick. Uh, when you were standing up and you were showing that stance, it looked very, it reminded me so much of uh, Street Fighter because it's the way you did it and it was that back and forth. That was Street Fighter. Yeah. I, boom, <laughs> see, I, I was like, ah, oh, that's Street Fighter. <laughs> Yeah, that's a Street Fighter idol. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys, were you guys taught that? Or was that, because you see it in all the characters right before, you know, right before you guys fight. Is that, um, that you know, I mean, that's obviously the stance before you guys fight. Sure. sure. That, it's one of the, we, we have a class called Introduction to Motion Capture, and we teach you a lot of the secrets of the basic ideas mm. when you're working in, in motion capture, doing performance capture. One of the basic ideas is, first off, it's, it's a style of animation. And there's two major styles of animation. There's keyframe animation, and there's motion capture. In either of those, if the character isn't moving, it's just the picture. It's nothing else. It's just the picture that's not moving. And it's a very expensive picture on the real estate of somebody's screen. So you can't afford to not be moving. So instead of, in reality, you might do this. But I'm not moving. So to give the illusion of movement, First, I'll breathe, and then second, because it's because of Street Fighter, I'll give an over uh, performance of fighting stance. So first, I'll go, and this looks like I'm breathing. Because I'm talking, you know that I'm not breathing, but it's the illusion of breathing. Then second, 
I'll do this. So you get the, the sense of I'm, I'm, I'm ducking and weaving. It's just an illusion to, to help the animation process along. And right. some characters have a higher uh, frequency, bigger characters have a slower frequency and a bigger breath, but it gives the illusion that helps the, the characterization of whoever we're doing. And it's a little bit different for every, th these are mostly video game things. You don't usually do this in a film. For every video game, you, you either turn that up and make it bigger or turn it down and make it smaller and more subtle. You played one of the most legendary monsters ever as Godzilla. So can you tell our audience how that whole process happened and what ran through your mind when you found out you are playing the king of the monsters? Decades earlier, my dad took me to my very first movie ever. He took me to a movie theater to go see the very first movie that I'd ever seen on, on a big screen. That movie was called Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. And I'm sitting there, and it's the biggest image that I've ever seen, the biggest moving image, because I'd never seen a movie before. And I don't know if you've ever seen Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. It was probably from, it's either late 60s or early 70s. Things were really psychedelic back then. I don't know if the rating system was even in place yet. So he took a probably a four, five-year-old, six-year-old into a movie where the smog monster, it, it flies over the city and wherever it flies, it leaves a trail of toxic slime. everything. And it doesn't just kill you, it melts your skin and leaves a skeleton behind. So I saw that and I'm like, <laughs> I, I was like, oh my God, that thing is evil. And then at the end of the movie, Godzilla kills it. And if I remember correctly, I want to say he eats his eyeballs, if I remember correctly. And I'm like, Ah, this is awesome! So, so I, was, I was horrified and hopped up on sugar at the same time. So I'm like, ah! So that is how I started my cinematic adventure. And that burnt into my brain. Flash forward. My friend, I, I was working on video games and movies and stuff. And my schedule was really, really full. Uh, my friend called. He's like, dude, I, I need some help with uh, creature movement. Can you help me out? Now, I literally thought that he was asking for people to, for, for me to suggest some people because I was too busy to work on other things at the point. So I'm like, oh yeah, try this guy, try this guy, uh, try these two ladies, see which one you like, see, see if it works. So he calls me two days later. He's like, dude, I need you to come in and help me with the movement. I'm like, okay, cool. I thought he, he picked one of them and he wanted me to come in and, and help them find the movement because I can, I can help you with your, your movement, your creature movement. So I went in there and there was only three people there and him. And I saw a crew in the back building and he goes, okay, thank you for coming. All right. So here's the thing. And he looks at the first guy, you're Muto number one, you're Muto number two and you're Godzilla. And I was like, <laughs> what? <a> what? <laughs> what? Yeah. And I, I was speechless. I'm like, yeah, you know, so <laughs> I, uh, Godzilla is the oldest cinematic franchise in the world. It is 65 years old. I just went to Japan to Toho Studios, who owns Godzilla, to celebrate his 65th birthday. I got to speak to like 19, 20,000 people in the town square as the current Godzilla. I'm the first American Godzilla. Um, wow. It's a huge honor. That's one of their national treasures. It is one of the most recognizable symbols and characters in the world. Uh, so to get to even touch that historic legacy is a massive honor. And to get to be called back to do it for Godzilla King of Monsters, that was Godzilla 2014, to be called back to do it for Godzilla King of Monsters, wow, it was freaking awesome. So I'm very proud of that and uh, I'm floored that I get to carry that, that title, King of the Monsters. Now Oh, I do, can I show you something? I, you yes. know what? Hold on one sec. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> Godzilla has left the room. <laughs> Godzilla has left the chat. Thanks. <laughs> Godzilla's back. Godzilla's back. And he's coming yeah. back to something awesome. <laughs> oh, boy. This is stuff that artists do. I get, uh, it's a little shiny. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Uh, these are things that, that wow. a lot of the artists will 
uh, give to me at a lot of the cons. And I oh, love it. That's oh, the best. Wow. Godzilla versus Shin Godzilla. Godzilla. Yeah, Shin Godzilla. Okay. But these. This is black and white. Oh, wow. Oh, so, that's so oh, good. Oh. Nice. Uh, and so these, I, I get these and I'm. This is a dude brought me this. I'm sorry. This is something wow. else. Like, Aww, like, I made it. this for you. I drew this. I'm like, oh, this is so it's, no, seriously. Yeah. It is. You, it is so good. I'm, I'm so happy to, to get to, to receive these amazing. So cool. Oh, yeah. Great fan art there. And one more. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I love that. Enjoy, enjoy the movement. Inside, like. Uh, wait, there's more. There's more. I know. Ah. Oh, gosh. There you are. Ah, nice. Oh. I'm, I'm, it, it lights up and it has all these cool, it's got flame things and its eyes light up and it's. Wait, it lights up? Yeah, it's, it's kind of bright. So in the remote controls over there, I'm not going to take time to try to do it, but it does light up. It is. It could be, you so know. What? Awesome. Wow, I it's love like it. an Academy Award for playing Godzilla. I love it. It's amazing. And I have tons yeah. of these. I'm so fortunate to get to receive this stuff from people that is just like me. We're, we're fans. Yeah. And I think it's so important that people who love what they do have a hand in doing the thing. I remember watching lots of, of the Batmans, lots of the Spider-Mans, and I was like, I, my mind stepped back and I was like, that was nice. That was cool. That was fun. I enjoyed it. Then I remember watching, it was Iron Man. John Favreau directed Iron Man. And I was watching him like, oh, that's cool. He would do that. Yeah, that's him. He would do that. John Favreau is a comic book fan. So he gets into it when he does this stuff and he does it with that passion. Plus, He's a real filmmaker. He also understands how to tell a story. He has the skills to direct. When you put those two worlds together, passion and technical know-how, it is unbeatable combo. So I think that is so important. And I, I'm a fan too. I'm an absolute fan of most of these things that I get to, to play with. And I hope that I bring that level of, of joy to the work. I love it. You definitely bring it to the fans and i agree with you when you're when you are a nerd and you're working within the genre that you nerd out you would normally nerd out over it just adds that much more level of excitement i i did star trek and i was a huge trekkie even before i was blessed enough to be a part of the franchise and just like you man i i've been in those movie theaters where godzilla was playing sometimes it'd be like a, a like a double feature um, like a lot of the martial arts movies that would yes. be, you know, yeah, you'd see like a double feet or sometimes it'd be like an all day uh, thing. And um, so, yeah, man, it, it's, it's, it's the best when you are in a franchise that you can just totally lose your mind over because like you said, man, you grew up watching that and now you are it. It's the, it's the, it's the ultimate dream, man. Now, what did you do with Star Trek, man? Yeah, sure. I did a pilot called Star Trek Renegades. Ah. And it started uh, 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 Tim Russ, uh, who played Tuvok in Star Trek Voyager. And it had a, like a who's who of sci-fi actors from Star Trek, uh, 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 Star Wars, Blade Runner. Oh my gosh, just wow. all these different franchises. Yeah, and I played, I played the bad guy, Boros. <gasps> these huge prosthetic, uh, um, this huge prosthetic makeup, this long wit. It was, it, was, it was an amazing experience. And I was also in the Orville as well, which as you know, I'm sure a lot of Star Trek fans yes. are fans of as well. So, but yeah, yeah, I had the opportunity to do that. And, and I tour a lot to cons like you do and uh, got the table, got the fans, got people coming up. and That's you know, awesome. Man. So That's yeah, it's, it's the best when you get things like the fan art and the people coming up to you, telling you, you how much uh, a, a 60 plus year old franchise means to them and how much they love the fact that you're doing what you're doing Absolutely. and holding it down. And I could also, I'm sure it's, it's almost safe to say that you also made history again as being the first black man to play Godzilla, unless I'm wrong. Nope, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Big one, yeah. 
So, I, it, it, I think it's awesome. It, it, I'm so fortunate and so blessed to get to do, we get to do what, th this kind of stuff. It's amazing. And it's, it's playtime for us actors. It is a time to play and to explore and to be a kid in the sandbox. It's amazing. Any crazy or fun stories you can share while wearing and performing motion capture as Godzilla? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the first one, we didn't, we didn't have the tail. We didn't really think about it. So in the choreography, uh, I was like, well, what happens if, because we're, we're trying to find constantly new and interesting ways that are true to the character of fighting. I'm like, I have this tail. Why don't I tail slap him into the building and let the building fall on him? And they're like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, do that. I'm like, it's going to be weird because it's hard to just go like this, turn around, and then have the other guy imagine that there's a tail going boom like that. The timing is not quite right in your imagination unless you're really good at imagining stuff like that. So um, I was like, it would be better if we had a tail. So we ended up getting a big piece of foam and we just cut it into a long triangle that tapers down at one end. And I was like, yeah, that's perfect. It was, it was, I don't know, probably eight feet long, 10 feet long. And we needed a way to attach it to me. We didn't have any of this stuff and, and we're shooting in, in a, a big open lot. So. I was like, uh, does anybody have a belt or a weightlifting belt or anything? And nobody had anything. So I was like, oh, I got my belt from karate in the trunk. Let, let me grab that. So I ran outside, got my belt, and we, t we drilled a hole through it. And I, so I have a, a black belt on with a tail attached to my butt. And <laughs> I'm walking around with my black belt going, roar, roar. And, and that is how we did the first Godzilla. We Use a piece of foam. And the second one, they went uh, to a place called Fonco here in Los Angeles, and they made me an articulated tail, which is spectacular. And I wish I had it, although I don't have a place to store it. I would love to have it because it was amazing and it looks awesome and it was properly built for me and, and it worked amazingly. But in that first one, it was hilarious. Also, the Mutos, the, the monsters in Godzilla 1, there was one on crutches, there, a, a guy walking on crutches so he could articulate like a spider. And then the other guy, he was a flying Muto. He played the one that flew. Um, he, we put trash bags under his arms just so you could see his wings because we didn't know where his wings were and we had to be, pay attention to them. And when he wasn't shooting, it's not easy. To, it's called a rig. That's how you get somebody up in the air on all the wires. It's not easy to get people in and out of certain rigs. So they would just leave him hanging there for like 20 minutes. His name was Hutchinson, James Hutchinson. He would just be like, no, you guys go ahead. I'll just, I'll, I'll just be here. And <laughs> he would just hang there just and hanging out. he'd be doing the fight. And he'd just be like, no, I'm good. Can I get some water? That'd be nice. And it was awesome. <laughs> There's nothing he could do. It was amazing. But that's, that's how we did it on the first one. It was really fun though. That's really cool that they took your ideas and they were willing to roll with it. Again, this is a franchise that was around before any of us were born. It's always a collaboration. Um, we just yeah. try to find, everybody comes up with ideas and we try to find the best solution because you're constantly problem solving on sets. Uh, we don't have enough daylight. We, the scene is too long. We don't know how to slap you with your giant tail. All of those weird things pop up and how do you fix that? So yeah. <laughs> First, first world actor problems. <laughs> How do I slap that? <laughs> hmm. All right. Our guest today is TJ Storm. This is the Lightning Hour, and we'll be right back. You gotta be kidding. I mean, I fangirl, you know, when I've seen your resume, I fangirl, um, watching Godzilla with you, I fangirled, 
Um, so let's talk about some of your other performance capture performances that you've gotten to do. Because, I mean, you've gotten to be Iron Man in Captain America Civil War, um, Ant-Man in Ant-Man, Godzilla in Godzilla, and Godzilla King of the Monsters, Colossus in Deadpool, the Apex Predator in Predator, and Darth Vader in Vader Immortal and in the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. And people that, you know, are going to hear this are thinking, huh, I thought that that's just Robert Downey Jr. That's, you know, Iron Man and Paul Rudd as Ant-Man. So can you explain, you know, how it works? Like if you're playing, um, if you're doing the motion capture for someone that will have a different actor on screen. We all, in, we'll talk about film. In film, we all have different jobs. Um, The actor has uh, two very large jobs. One, to make you care about the character and to carry the story. Um, and then two, his, his, the, second, the actor's second job is to be a face that you recognize so easily that you feel like you know them. Because you know them, you feel like, oh, that's my friend. I feel like I know that person. I want to go see them in that movie. And then greater number of people will go see that particular person. Robert Downey Jr. has been one of my favorite actors uh, for literally for decades and I will see whatever he was in. Now, when Robert Downey Jr. starts fighting at high speed and gets blown through a wall, now they call him the stuntman. Now, that's, he because he's playing Tony Stark. Now Tony Stark is being played by somebody else, somebody who has a particular set of skills to make that particular scene look absolutely incredible. Now, we're getting ready to shoot Robert Downey Jr., but Robert, Down, Robert Downey Jr. is not done in makeup yet, but we still have to light the scene. Now you have somebody called a stand-in. Stand-in comes in, stands, he's the same height, same skin tone, uh, same facial features and hair color as Robert Downey Jr., but you'll, you, most of the time you won't see him uh, on film. And if you do, you only see the backside of him or, or, or the side for just a second. But stand-ins work as well, and they're just as important because if you have to wait for the actor, then your entire schedule gets pushed. Okay, great. Then you have people with specialty skills. So if they have to fly or if they have to move a certain way in the Iron Man armor or something like that, then they start to call people like us, uh, specialty performers. And one of my specialties is emulating movement. So I look at all the examples of how he moved before, I look at how rigid the armor is and where it can move and where it can't move. So Iron Man armor can't do this. It can't, it doesn't have all this play. So everything he does is and it's it's a little more stiff in the middle. So we go back in and we do all the stuff that need that needs to be done in those particular scenes. Now Part of the scenes that I'm in is already shot by the stuntman wearing some of the armor and stuff like that and some motion capture gear. And then they look at it and Disney decides, well, we like this, but we don't like how this part plays and there's not enough of this. So let's rebuild this. They'll call me in on a separate stage. I was never on the real stage. They'll call me in on a separate stage and I'll redo parts of the, the shots or entire shots so that it lines up with the collaborative vision <clears throat> as well as the vision of the director. So that's uh, in a in in a compressed way. That is kind of how it is to make films. And then there's entire other groups of people: the editor, the music, the, the special effects team, the color team. They all come in and they all do their own parts to make that character completely come to life. So you appeared in the reboot of Kickboxer, starring Dave Bautista and Jean Claude Van Damme, mm-hmm. and as well as soon to be released supernatural thriller Revenger on Netflix and Betrayed. I'm sure that's always a nice change of pace, right? When you can switch things up like that. It is. I get to jump between all of those things quite often. And, and I'm really happy. I actually started uh, in this business. I was originally a dancer and then I became, I got a recording contract and, and that's not my thing. And then I went on to become an actor. And the first 20 movies I did were probably all kickboxing movies, all action movies. Uh, whether it was kickboxing or, or kung fu or, or sword fighting, whatever it was, it was always some kind of crazy action. Then I went to acting school, realized, oh my God, I can't act. I should have probably done this before. The first 20 movies did not. Those movies, <laughs> you watch those movies. You are not missing anything. If you never see any of those movies, you will be 
you'll have a better life if you don't watch those movies. <laughs> I think every actor has that. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly though, exactly. And, and then I, I, I kept on working uh, as an actor and, and, and strengthening my, my base craft, which is acting. It was already on top of my other base, which was martial arts, dance, and movement. And those things fortunately combined to allow me to have a career in uh, acting and performance capture. And because I was nerding out and already making the sounds, I got into voice as well. So uh, that was fun. How was that creating those characters that, that are basically <clears throat> immortalized? Immortalized in one way is to say that uh, I did it now this way. But if you look at something like Spider-Man, Spider-Man's been immortalized like eight times. Batman has been immortalized like 14 times. Uh, you just do your version. And, and if you believe in it, if you're true to it, and if you're a fan of it especially, uh, but if you're a serious craftsperson, you just give your soul to that character temporarily so that you can pilot that character the best way you can. And then hopefully it leaves a mark. Hopefully people are like, yeah, that was that kid. That's, that's how you do that character. <laughs> and then yeah. maybe, and then if you're lucky, 10, 20, 30 years from now, people are, are the next one to come in and they look back and they're like, man, I got to be part of this. Look at who did it before me. That's cool. So I'm just trying to do my part in this time right now. Do you say that the fans like at the conventions and stuff like that have been very uh, welcoming towards your your interpretations of these these characters yeah in a lot of cases yes and then there's others who are like yeah i don't like that man that was weak yeah. <laughs> and that's fine also that's totally cool because i feel the same way about a lot of stuff and that's that's what you really get from our our community is it's all about your opinion and you're just you're you're just throwing it out to the crowd in the best way you can. Hopefully the majority of opinions enjoy what you did. And then the, the negative opinions over here, they're, they're either on the fence or they'll, they'll stick with their old version and they'll, be, they'll, they'll stick with that version. And that's okay, that is totally fine. I actually appreciate that because I don't know, if you have hung out with nerds, and I'm talking to everybody who's listening, true nerds, We'll have the dumbest conversation. That will give you two examples. One, I have three friends. Uh, Van is one, Jason is the other. We get in the same argument about every six months. Van will say something like this. Uh, Superman is the strongest. And then Jason will be like, actually, Hulk has no upper limit. And I'm like, you know what? It's not about strength. Silver Surfer is the shit. So there's that. <laughs> and then boom, it's gone. We start right. arguing. Yeah, but Hulk could never touch Superman because Superman flies. Hulk could jump into space. Who jumps into space? That's stupid. Once he's there, what's he gonna do? He's gonna float? <laughs> so so we we get into this ridiculous argument, yeah. yelling at each other, walking down the street. Is the dumb, but everybody feels me. They understand it. Yeah. Second example. We were on the set of, it was, it was actually Star Trek. It was the first Star Trek with J.J. Abrams. And we're suppo I, I was a Klingon, and my friend Esteban was a Klingon. We're I'm 6'2", Esteban's like 6'5", and we're big. And we're supposed to go to Eric Vanna, who's a Romulan, and we're supposed to fight with him. And we're like, well, how are we going to get this fight done? I'm like, it should be through trickery. He should be clever and find a way to beat us. And then somebody goes, wait, aren't Romulans strong? Like really strong. I'm like, okay, they ain't stronger than a Klingon. And they're like, well, actually, I'm like, actually, what? Romulans are not stronger than Klingons. We got into this. Keep in mind, while this is happening, J.J. Abrams is sitting there. He's first. He's like this because he wants to know. Then he's like, <laughs> all right. When you guys figure this out, I'll be back. And he just took off while we're arguing. I'm like, Klingons are a warrior race. How is he gonna be stronger? He's like a scientist. He's like a scientist. How is he gonna beat us? That doesn't even make sense. I'm not gonna fall. We got into the biggest argument. It was so stupid, but it was necessary because you can't lay down on Romulans are stronger than Klingons. If you are at home, by the way, thinking that Romulans are stronger than Klingons, turn off now. Just 
click because no, no. TJ, <laughs> don't you do it? Don't, I can see it. No, no. Listen, no. come back, man. You started this. Michelle, we need popcorn, you and I. You started this, man. <laughs> no. Listen, I'm going to say this, and I'm not going to, I'm not, I, listen, this is all I'm going to say. We don't come back here, man. Don't do this. And you're going to bring a lightsaber to a Star Trek fight? Come on, man. You're going to bring a lightsaber. Hold up. Let me, hold on. You're going to bring a lightsaber to a Star Trek fight. Well, I'm going to say this, Rochelle, your nerd car would get blocked. In, in <laughs> Listen, this is all I'm going to say. The reason why your boy probably said that is because in the original series, you saw many situations where Spock was showing massive amounts of strength, sometimes against Kirk, sometimes in other situations. Hold on, ladies. We, we're almost done here. And with that said, they are, you know Vulcans are strong, and Romulans are the cousins of Vulcans. They are strong. And it's not to say that Klingons aren't strong. They, they're, they're strategic. They're warriors. They, they, they got all that in them. It's never truly been proven whether or not they are actually stronger because Vulcans could basically take out a whole room if they wanted to, not to mention the nerve pinch. That's all I'm going to say on that. Now, I'm don't not bring in the nerve pinch. That. Don't bring in the nerve pinch. You can't bring in the nerve pinch. That is like, that's like a, you don't, if you're stronger, do you ever learn how to go boop? No, nobody boops when they're stronger. You bam, blah, boom. But you sometimes know, you just want to stop it and just end it. It's kind of like the, the equivalent of kicking somebody in the stuff. So it's like, let's end this. You know what I mean? Bam, <laughs> boom. Fight's done. This is the exact argument we got into for an hour. For an hour, it was ridiculous. I know. By the way, <laughs> it, 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 and and we got it got even deeper. We got into okay. Vulcans oh, I know, are, I know. Vulcans are canned up their entire life, except for a couple of times during their lifetime when they. Burr. So okay, that's an adrenaline rush, and that's fine. It's like a woman lifting uh, a car off her baby, but not all the time. And then Romulans are all like, burr, 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 burr. they're all over the place all the time. So. That's their thing. So they don't have that bottled up pressure. They are already emotional. So they don't get that same bonus. And they don't poop. So there's all of that together. You, you're just going to hold me on that poop, aren't, aren't you? <laughs> the man who brought a lightsaber to the Star Trek battle. Battle. This is the lightning hour. We have TJ Storm, ultimate nerd Godzilla. So many things. We will be right back for more nerdism. It was my assumption that those demons would prove far inferior in the face of your tactics. Humans. They are but stubborn and foolish. It takes a journey to hell for them to accept and praise their god. A fact that tickles Irony's judgment. That is what you think. And that is why I wait in your Father!
fuck are you? Information about your daughter. Maya? James! Thank God. Maya. Maya. Are you all right? It's not her anymore, is it? I'm talking to you. She is allowing me to speak through her. Allowing? We've studied you in great detail, Professor. We've drawn from that to make a proposal that would end hostilities between us. In exchange for sanctuary, we will set aside a protected area where human survivors will be relocated. Some kind of prison camp. You must be familiar with the concept. It's taken directly from your own history. Be honest. Oppression is in your nature. The ones who will decide if your world lives or dies. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the nerdy edition of The Lightning Hour. You guys have all been waiting for this. I know I have. TJ, <sighs> you know, <laughs> you teach mocap at Mind's Eye Tribe Action Actors Academy in L.A., I know how amazing it is because I've gone to your classes. I go to your classes. It is some of the most fun you'll ever have in a class. So educational. And if you're a nerd, it's like <laughs> you get really passionate about it. It's so fun. Could you tell our audience if somebody's wanting to get into the world of mocap, could you explain a little bit about more like what the classes are like and talk a little bit like how you got into teaching and, you know, what made you want to be a teacher in mocap and stunts? Absolutely. Um, I have been in the martial arts since I was a little kid. And in our school, they used to, I went to a, a, a Okinawan-based American karate, but my original teachers were Japanese. The head instructor uh, didn't even speak English. Uh, the the, the sub-instructors spoke English. Uh, so it was really hardcore. Um, one of the things they would always say is to learn plus to teach is to know. So they would teach you the moves. You'd have to practice and prove that you knew them. But then eventually when you got to a certain belt level, you had to teach. So I was teaching when I was a teenager, I was teaching people older than me, younger than me, but I was already teaching. And I had teaching is its own thing. It's a particular way of communicating ideas so that somebody can get it easily. So that said, I've been teaching at least for 30 years. So so, and that's the martial arts. So I, I've had this career where I've gotten to play some amazing characters. I, I've made tons of mistakes. I've learned tons of lessons. And all the while I've been in training in other arts as well, uh, directing, acting, all, all of the arts that are, are needed for cinematic pursuits. And now that I've done all of these things, especially as they got po more popular, people are like, man, this is really cool. How do I get into this? Or how do I do this? Or I have an audition. How do I prepare for it? I was getting that question so much that uh, I was like, you know what? Let's, let's teach some of this. So uh, I, I have a friend, her name is Andy Norris. She, she was, yeah, she's, she's an amazing uh, creature performer. She, she worked on uh, uh, Vader Immortal as a Rancor, which is a giant monster in the Star Wars world. Um, and, and she's worked on other stuff. She worked with me on uh, the Predator Hunting Grounds video game. Um, she, she was like, yeah, I, I, let's do it. Let's put this school together. So I put the curriculum together. We built it. And we started teaching people everything you need to know, not just for performance capture and motion capture, but for action acting. Because it, there's acting, which... Actors absolutely love. They, they want that monologue. They would love to have the pain, the emotional 
angst. They want all of that. And then there's other styles of actors that love action. They want to do the action movies. They want to do all the fun stuff. They want to fight with swords. They want to chase people with guns and get blown up. But they don't want to be stuntmen. That's a little different. Stunts has its own particular set of skills, which also requires some performance, but it require, requires a great amount of physical training. And then action actors, they want to be on screen and still do some of the action, uh, if not as much as, as, much as they can, uh, leaving the, the, the most impressive stuff for the stuntmen, but they want to be able to swing the sword. They want to be able to fight and do all these cool moves and stuff like that. So to do that, they come to us, whether it's for film, television, video games, uh, we teach actors how to perform action properly. And now that we have our acting teacher, Annie Draymond, uh, we also have a great acting instructor. So you have a strong acting base uh, combined with uh, classes for swords. We have the way of the sword. Uh, Terence Rotolo is our sword master and he absolutely knows all of these incredible sword styles. Everything from the Western styles, including the Italian styles, the Spanish styles, the, the French fencing styles, uh, to the Asian styles, including the Japanese uh, style, the samurai styles, the Chinese uh, flying sword, wudong styles, and stuff like that. He trained you in the basic use of cinematic swords, as well as the, the culture that they came from. Because when you're playing a character, you really need to know where they came from. And that's true of almost everything. And in swords, it really shows. A samurai is much different than a French fencer. So if you have all of that under your belt, you're more prepared for all the additions you could, you could potentially come up against. Um, we do it for action. We have action classes, which is basic how to punch and get hit and stuff like that. Uh, taught by Van Ayasset, who is currently working on a Bruce Willis film. Um, we, wow. have, oh, we have firearms with Brandon Elmore. Uh, he is a veteran of both the Army and the Marines. He taught urban warfare uh, to his units uh, that he was responsible for and he worked in Afghanistan. So he has the reality of the situation as well. So he can teach you the, the fun, fancy John Wick style, which is car system where you're bent and you have this cool look, or he can, he can teach you the real room clearing stuff that you would use as a Marine if you're gonna work on a more serious film, um, or if you're gonna work on Call of Duty. Those, even though it's a video game, they're really strict about, or Battlefield, they're really strict about how you guys line up and how you work as a unit. And if you don't know how to do that, you have no chance of getting those parts a lot of the time. So we make sure that you know how to, to look correct with a weapon as well as have all of the safety installed in your weapon use so that people believe that you've actually held a firearm before. We teach you all of that in the safest way possible. We start you with a Nerf gun and you slowly graduate until you can operate a proper fire weapon. So. Yeah, these are some of the things we do. We have, like I said, magic, sorcery, and the force, which teaches you the movement and the rules of magic in a cinematic universe. We have uh, heroes and superheroes. It's called The Hero's Journey, which is based on Joseph Campbell's work, Hero with a Thousand Faces. We just taught that yesterday, and it was an amazing class. Uh, you learn not only what The Hero's Journey is and how it affects your character and your place in a script, but you also learn how to hold different superhero positions which are very specific and if you're not a super fan of this stuff if you didn't grow up reading comic books you won't know how you, you don't you won't know what's wrong with the way you're squatting down like spider-man uh that's a very particular position um that's called a feral ferals spider-man uh wolverine uh these kind of characters have very particular uh movements that tend to be asymmetrical and very instinctual whereas a paragon like superman they stand Boom, they have this very strong presence. Captain America is a paragon. They stand for a belief in something more beyond themselves. And we teach you where their emotional center is, as well as how do, does it stand. And then in the higher level classes, levels two and level three, we teach you how to move, how to perform in those particular postures and archetypes. So yes, we have all kinds of amazing classes uh, centered on getting you to move well, getting you to perform well, while staying true to your character and true to the vision of the people who are bringing the script to you to make it come to life at the Minds Eye Tribe Action Action Academy. Two things come to mind in terms of what you were saying in terms of training and things like that. Um, I remember when, they, when, when Iron Man came out and they were showing Iron Man uh, flying 
and it 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 was a it was more about his takeoff and how it wasn't just the boots that were propelling him up. He was also using his hands as well. And when you look at that, you're like, you know what? That makes sense because, and I think they kind of touched on it in the beginning of Iron Man when it was just his boots and he was flipping around and he ended up crashing into the thing, uh, into like the wall or something like that. And I was like, okay, I could see why they would have him use his uh, hands where his repulsor rays would come out to level that out. The other thing that came to mind, and tell me if this was uh, of you guys' doing or if this was just uh, something that was written. I love it. And it was also a part of um, uh, Deadpool, the superhero landing. And when Deadpool mentions, watch, 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 she's about to do the superhero landing. I thought that was brilliant because you really do see that all the time. Yes. Okay. That is actually in Heroes Level 2. <clears throat> I have seen, I can't tell you how many people I have seen mess up the superhero landing and it you know what it looks like and you can probably get into it but landing in it is not as easy as it looks unless you're an athlete slamming down onto one flat foot one ball of the foot and onto your knee and making it look like <laughs> quiet and land solid is harder than it looks so we teach you how to do that stuff we teach you the basic skills now we have a, like i mentioned uh Andy Norris is one of our instructors at our school. She teaches a class called Creature Fit, and it uses animal flow and all of these, these strength-building exercises. It's just workouts, but the workouts are intense, and they get your musculature strong enough to accept these positions that we're talking about. The superhero landing is one of the most iconic things, and you won't think about this, but standing out of the superhero landing requires so much muscular control, especially when they want that cool shot. If you want to be the one hired to have a career in this business and they, you want them to call you back all the time, mm -hmm. you got to have these skills set in your bones. So that's what we teach, really. You also support a lot of charities in your spare time and you make a point of supporting those charities that work with racial equality and animals, children and education, so many uh, things. Could you tell us about that a little bit more? I, I am really fortunate to be able to, to help do what I can help others. I, I, in, education is really important to me. Racial equality, it's extraordinarily important to me. It always has been because, quite honestly, it affects me. I understand it. I grew up, uh, I was born in Indiana. I was probably the only person with a dark skin color in my entire school when I was five, six. I didn't know that I wasn't white until a kid pointed it out. A kid pointed it out and that started a fight between us. But I didn't know up until that point. And then you grow up with it. I mean, I get into arguments with people all the time, but to give them a sense of what it's like to not be like them, I'll say, look, imagine this. I don't drink and I don't smoke. I never have. I've never been drunk, but in my life, on average, especially between, well, after, when I hit about 20 years old, on average, I got pulled over about once every three months for nothing. My girlfriend at that time was a judge. She was literally a federal judge. And she looks at me, she says, what'd you do? I'm like, I didn't do anything. It's normal, watch, watch. And she just sat there and the cop came up, he leaned in my window and he goes, so, you on parole? I'm like, nope. Nope, what can I help you with, sir? And we went from there and she turned red. And I just put my hand on her arm and I'm like, just another day, just watch. I want you to see the entire thing. He talked so much crap, but that is what it is to be black in America. And it's part of it that should not be part of it. It is not right. It is not, it should not in any way, shape or form be normal. Um, so that said, it is that that Black Lives Matter is marching for. It is that kind of stuff that, and that's the nice end. That is about as nice as it gets. When, when people cross the street because they're scared of you for some imaginary reason, that's the light end of it. The dark side is the violence and, and that stuff we're fighting against. I think it also begins in education. And so I, 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 I love to support charities that either strengthen our educational system uh, or 
or change our system so that we can one little ding at a time bang out the systemic racism that is already built into our system. Uh, we have to fight each one of these little pieces one at a time. We all have some tinge of it. So we have to actively, consciously fight it at every single turn. And I love animals. I, I, I absolutely love animals. So whenever I can, I, they're another group that can't speak for themselves. They can't fend for themselves. So I, I love, I've had animals my entire life, uh, cats and dogs for me, but I love helping out when I can. And I love seeing them become part of the family unit, becoming part of your family, my family. So all of those things are important to me. And I love to support those when I can. With, with us being in this COVID environment and mm -hmm. things being different and locked down, um, have you had the opportunity to, to still work at all? Um, being on set? And uh, if so, how, how, how has that been since the industry has shut down? And, and how different has that been in terms of what you're normally used to, what that the, the old normal and compared to what is now the temporary new normal? Right before uh, COVID hit, I got to work on something literally called the March. It was a, it, it's a performance capture job uh, that recreates the Martin Luther King March. Every person that was there that they could get a hold of, they scanned uh, mm. and we recreated the march so that it could be played in, in museums, which it is currently playing. <clears throat> Again, when museums open up, you'll be able to go visit it. I, I, I don't know where it is right now. It might be in Washington or it might be in New York or Chicago. I'm not really sure, but it's called the March. It's in conjunction with Time Magazine. And mm. one of the people that I met there was a guy who stood next to Martin Luther King on the day that he gave the speech. And he, he talked to us and that blew us away. He said the same things you're saying, it is different. I'm glad to be part of this time, this different time. I am so proud of it, but we have so far to go at the same time. Um, but that said, I, I, if you get a chance, go check out the March. It is absolutely amazing. For working, um, I am working right now. Uh, fortunately, because uh, Often what I do can be done by myself in the middle, not near anybody. There's like three techs behind the, the, the computers, uh, well on the other side of the room, and they're all wearing masks and gloves and stuff like that. Uh, and then I do my job in the center of the volume. Back in the old days, when the technology wasn't as strong, uh, we could only have one person in the volume. So. I literally would have a conversation and then they say, cut, that was great, go to the other side. And then I'd have a conversation with myself. I would do the other character. They would just change what I look like and I would be several characters on a day. Uh, and that's how we did it. So it's very comfortable for me to fortunately do it. Um, but I'm one of the few, there's so many people not working right now. And that includes, I mean, they just closed everything today uh, again. So the people that work at restaurants, the people that, that work in the gyms, the people who need to work out, the people who have normal jobs, they're not able to work and that hurts, man. I really feel that. Uh, I, I wish I could help more. I wish I could be working more, but we're all kind of in this together. And it feels like the more that we can team up and fight COVID with whatever we can do. Is it wearing a mask? Great. Is it staying, staying distant? Great. Is it staying at home more often? Great. Let's do this together and, and put this thing down because it hurts, man. It hurts us all. There's people who want to work, who they, they were probably just getting ready to hit their stride or maybe, maybe they got a new TV show and they're just ready to shoot. Poof. I know a lot of people that just lost their their uh, pilot shows or returning back to their show. And that's, that's in our business. Yeah. There's other people who just want to feed their family and they got nothing right now. So we gotta, we have to fight this. We have to find our way through this and get to the other side to help us. It's time on our show for the lightning round of random questions. What type of music do you like the most? Uh, the music that makes me move, that, that is what I love. 
My musical taste is all over the place, but the songs that make me get out and move, they motivate me. D&D or Magic the Gathering? D&D. I'll tell you why. Dungeons and Dragons, D&D is Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons, uh, it's open-ended. It's your imagination and it doesn't stop. Magic the Gathering is really fun. I play Magic the Gathering. I get destroyed online. And you guys who have made those decks that are just unbeatable, that's, that's not right. It's not even fun. I don't even know why you play. It's just, oh, look at me playing 15 cards in one round. I'm like, why? <laughs> why? But, but it's, that, that is limited by the possibilities that are directly in front of you and your choices and the choice that you have access to. Because there's some cards that are so rare you have to wait weeks to right. get it. You have to work really hard to actually, get it. Actually, the reason why I brought up Magic the Gathering is I actually am on a Magic card. Um, I got to model <laughs> on a Magic card. So, yeah, I'm on a Magic card. What? That's yeah. awesome. What's, What's it called? It's really cool. Uh, I, it don't remember, I don't remember which one it's called. But I got multiple mm -hmm. actors involved and multiple models involved because I know one of the artists that works with them. And they do all the sketchings and paintings and then send it off so then they cool. can be on the cards. You'll never guess. You know the Queen Marchesa card? Yeah. That's my aunt. It is? <laughs> yes. And uh, they just took photos of her wearing it, and then they- That's asked, her? Drew, yeah, then they just drew a bigger dress on her. And yeah, and we also got to, uh, she and I got to pose in a few photos together, but I don't think any of those are on the card. I have a friend who, um, you know the, the pack of magic cards where the guy's wearing a cloak and he has you know, blue flames coming out? That's another yeah. one of my friends. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, that's that is so I cool. I've seen a film together before. Yeah, uh, Conrad Robles, that guy on that card, love him. And yeah, so I know multiple people. <laughs> that is amazing. Friends. I'm, I've never played Magic, but I'm in the Magic family because. Congratulations! <laughs> that is awesome. That is absolutely awesome. I love that. That gives a whole new meaning to small world, doesn't it? <laughs> that is awesome. All right, TJ. You have played the big guy. Yes. The big guy. Yeah. So, and I do, bro. I love you for it. I love it, love it, love it. But I got to know, are there any other giant famous monsters that you would just love to portray? Giant monsters? Let's just say monsters in general. I'm looking at the giant monsters. But, I mean, there's so many different, obviously, different mon Let's just say monsters in general. Who else would you like to play? Bigger uh I'll, I, I've never played an alien um, really? from the, the xenomorphs. I've never played one of the xenomorphs before. Uh, I, but after after Godzilla, and I am literally the biggest of the predators. I'm the predator that hunts other predators. <laughs> I I don't know. Yeah, I know. What else can you do? What do you do? What do you do after that? I I think. I mean, there's no now. Keep this in mind. Um, Hollywood tends to recycle stuff. But when I was a kid, the Predator was brand new. I'd never seen that thing before. So I know somebody out there right now, they, they might be listening to our voices right now. They got ideas and they have a sketch pad and they have created something that we have not seen yet. And they need to keep sketching. They need to get that out into the world because that on that thing in their sketchbook or in the back of their mind, that is the next predator. That is the next Godzilla. And the world is waiting to see it and we need to see it. I want to play that. I want to bring that to life. Uh, I think that's important. We need those new ideas. We need those artists and those dreamers to bring that stuff to light. So that is what I want to see. I haven't seen it yet, but that's what I want to play. Woo! Yeah! Well, and on that wonderful note, we want to say thank you so much, TJ, for joining us today. We had lots of fun, obviously, interviewing the king of the monsters. <laughs> so we cool. have got way more questions right now <laughs> right, that he wants to ask. But yeah. Well, well I, I just know this. I know that there is going to be, it's already happened. There is a kid or kids boys and girls who have sat in that theater just like you did with your father and they're going to be doing what they're going to basically be recreating your experience of seeing something and then either playing it 
or like you said, creating something new. So rest assured, it is, it is already being manifested. And I always like to say that representation matters as well. So it's such an honor to have you on here for the simple fact that it's good for people to see who is the dude in the suit right now. It's a young brother named TJ Storm, a black man who, again, representation matters. If I saw you, I'm watching this interview and I'm seeing you and I'm a little kid, that's going to stick. And I'm really, I'm really, really, I'm proud of the fact that you're, that you're carrying on that mantle and, and, and I thank you for representing and as, as a brother, as a black man, as a nerd, and just as all the cool things that you're doing right now. Cause I just, I, I had to take the moment to say that. Thank you. Thank you. And we definitely want you back on the show again in the future. So we can ask yeah. more and just nerd out more. With you. <laughs> please, please. Yeah. I would love how, to. How can we uh, find you on social media? How can people follow you? Um, the easiest way is to come to the Minds Eye Tribe dot com website minds i tribe dot com minds is plural m i d s um or you can follow me on instagram uh, you can just look up t j storm and you'll find my tag storms eye or on twitter which is t j storm zero one and you'll see me there uh and also facebook but most people don't use facebook as much anymore but yeah please come and hang out at the minds i tribe action action academy we'd love to play with you and Hope you get to be the next Godzilla, the next Darth Vader, the next Iron Man, the next Black Panther, whatever it is, we will help you get there. We have TJ Storm, an award-winning actor, seven-time martial artist, Hall of Fame inductee, teaches mocap at Mind's Eye Tribe Action Actors Academy in LA, has motion capture roles like The Predator, Darth Vader, The Punisher, Iron Man, Baby Groot, Teenage Groot, Ant-Man, Godzilla, and he's also one of my teachers. Adore him. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Thank you, TJ. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Thank you, TJ. This was the Lightning Hour. I'm Rico E. Anderson. I'm Rochelle Henry. And I'm Sasha Kerbel. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on the notifications. Follow us on social media. You can find more about our show and us, the hosts, in the description below. We have links. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next Friday. Same time, same place. Bye. Bye. Bye.